In this video, we'll talk about elementary matrices and how they relate to inverses of matrices. In the previous lecture, we talked about the multiplicative inverse of a matrix. But other than two by two matrices, we didn't really talk about how to find the inverse of a larger matrix. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about elementary matrices and how we use those elementary matrices to compute the inverse of a matrix given an invertible matrix. Okay, so what's an elementary matrix? So an elementary matrix is one that you get by starting with the identity matrix and doing one row operation. So for example, if we look at matrix E1 here, this is the result of adding four times row one to row three. Remember, that's that replacement operation. So we multiply a row by a scalar and then add that multiple to another row. E2 here is the result of swapping row 1 and row 2. And E3 here is the result of scaling row 3 by a factor of 5. In other words, multiplying that row by 5. Those were the three different row operations that we had. Replacement, swapping, and scaling. And so what we get when we do one of those operations to the identity matrix, we call the result an elementary matrix. Now the reason why we care about elementary matrices is watch what happens when we multiply one of these elementary matrices on the left by a matrix A. So when we do this product, when we multiply across the first row and down each of the columns, what we're just going to get is A, B, C. So we multiply 1 by A, 0 by D, 0 by G, add those results together, we just get A. Similarly, 1 times B, 0 times E, 0 times H, add those together, we get B. Similarly, when we go down the second row, across the second row of the matrix E1, and down the columns of the matrix A, we just get D, E, F. But now something different is going to happen when we go across the third row of matrix E1. We're going to get negative 4 times A plus G, we're going to get negative 4 times b plus h, and we're going to get negative 4 times c plus i. And so notice that the result of multiplying e1 by a is that we did the same row operation that we were talking about, but we did it to the matrix a. In other words, we replaced row 3 by negative 4 times row 1 plus row 3. That's the result of what has happened. We replaced row 3 by negative 4 times row 1 plus row 3. We did that same replacement operation that created the matrix E1, but we've done it to A rather than doing it to the identity matrix. And the same would be true about the matrices E2 and E3 that we talked about. Multiplying a matrix by an elementary matrix gives you, the, as a result, the, what you would get if you did that elementary row operation to that matrix that you multiply by. So let's see that here. When we multiply by E2, the result that we're going to get is D, E, F in the first row, A, B, C in the second row, and G, H, I in the third row. So the result is that we've swapped rows 1 and row 2 of A by multiplying E2 by A. Similarly, when we multiply E3 by A, the result is going to be that we will scale row 3 by a factor of 5 bringing it 5G, 5H, and 5I in that third row. So the conclusion here is that an elementary row operation, if we perform that on the matrix A, then we can represent the result in a matrix multiplication form. We can represent the result of doing that row operation as EA, where E is the elementary matrix. An important observation here is that because row operations are reversible, Elementary matrices have to be invertible, because all we do, the inverse of an elementary matrix, would just be to multiply by the opposite of that row operation. If you swapped rows 1 and 2, then you just swap them back. If you added 4 times row 3 to row 2, you add negative 4 times row 3 to row 2. If you scaled a row by a factor of 3, then you scale it again by a factor of 1 -third. So all of those elementary matrices, those are all invertible matrices, and we can tell exactly what the inverses would be. So in this case, if E is this elementary matrix that we got by replacing row 3 by negative 4 times row 1 plus row 3, 
then the inverse, if we believe what we just said on the previous slide, would be the opposite row operation, which would be to replace row 3 by positive 4 times row 1 plus row 3. And let's just check and make sure this works out. Remember to verify that two matrices are inverses. We multiply them in both possible orders and make sure that we actually get the identity. And when we multiply this out, lo and behold, we do in fact get the identity matrix with ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Similarly, when we multiply in this order, again, we get the identity matrix. Okay, so what are all these elementary matrices good for? Well, we have this theorem, which is going to tell us exactly how to figure out, first of all, when a matrix is invertible, and in addition to that, how to actually figure out what the, the inverse of that matrix is. So the theorem says two things. It says that a square matrix A is invertible if and only if A is row equivalent to the identity matrix. Remember, row equivalent here just means that it can be row reduced into the identity matrix. And any sequence of row operations that reduces A to the identity matrix will turn out to also transform the identity matrix into A inverse. So in other words, if we keep track of all of the different steps that we take, all of the different row operations that we take to transform A into the identity matrix, and we perform those same steps in the same order, we will transform the identity matrix into A inverse. And we'll see how that turns out in the proof. Okay, our theorem is an if and only if, which means we have to prove that the first statement implies the second statement, and the second statement implies the first statement. The first statement was that A was invertible, and the second statement was that A was row equivalent to the identity matrix. So let's start by assuming that A is invertible. Now we talked about that this means that the uh, matrix equation AX equals B has a solution for every B, and so it must be that capital A has a pivot in every row. Because if capital A didn't have a pivot in every row, then that, that equation wouldn't be consistent for every possible vector B. That's something we talked about a while back. But A is a square matrix. So if it has a pivot in every row, it's got to have a pivot in every column. And then the reduced row echelon form of that matrix A, it's got a pivot in every row and a pivot in every column, it's square. That's the identity matrix. And that means that A is row equivalent to the identity matrix. Now going the other direction is where the elementary matrices are going to come in. So we're going to, we're going to suppose that A is row equivalent to the identity matrix. So that means that there's some sequence of steps, each one a single row operation. And when we do those steps in order, we start with A and we end up with the identity matrix. So let's actually write down what those steps are. And each one of them is, can be represented by an elementary matrix. So E1, that's the first step, the first row operation that we need to turn A into the identity matrix. And E2, that's the matrix, the elementary matrix that represents the second step in transforming A into the identity matrix and so on and so on, and however many steps it takes, we're going to say it takes p steps here. So that number p is just, if it takes 533 steps, then that's what p is. If it takes four steps, then p is four, however many steps it takes. But remember that we can represent the result of doing one of those steps by multiplying by an elementary matrix. So the first step here is we multiplied by the matrix E1. And then the second step is we take the result and multiply it by E2. So now we've multiplied by two elementary matrices. And now we're going to multiply by three elementary matrices, and so on and so on, until we've multiplied by all of the elementary matrices, and the result is the identity. So this equation is going to be the equation that's going to work for us. So we're going to take that equation and multiply both sides by the inverse of the product of all of the elementary matrices. So on the left-hand side, we've multiplied by an inverse multiplied by the same matrix, so those are going to cancel out. So on the left-hand side, we just get A. And on the right-hand side, we multiplied by the identity, and multiply by that multiplying by the identity doesn't do anything. And so we get that A is the inverse of all of those elementary matrices. But that means that we can take the inverse of both sides, and we just get that A inverse is the product of all of those elementary matrices. And if we tack on a little identity matrix here, then multiplying the identity matrix by all of those elementary matrices, that shows us the second part of what the theorem says, 
which is that the inverse of A is the result of applying all of those elementary row operations to the identity matrix. Now, if we take the theorem at face value, what it sounds like we're going to have to do is keep track of every single step we take in row reducing the matrix and keep track of what all those steps are and then recreate those steps on the identity matrix. But it turns out we don't have to work that hard because what we can do is basically row reduce a double matrix. So we're going to augment our matrix A with a copy of the identity matrix. So we're going to take our matrix A, which in this case is 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, 3, 4, negative 3, 8, and we're going to tack onto it a copy of the identity matrix. And this double matrix, so you can imagine there's sort of like an imaginary dotted line there, that double matrix we're going to row reduce that. And eventually what this is going to turn out to be is because A is invertible, A is going to get row reduced into the identity matrix. And the fourth, fifth, and sixth columns here are just going to get carried along for the ride. And so what's going to be here once we're done row reducing, that's going to be A inverse because we're going to have performed the same row operations to that second half of that matrix. All right, let's see this in action. Okay, so if we want to reduce this matrix, first thing we need to do is get a pivot in the first row, first column. So we're going to swap rows 1 and 2. So now row 1 is 103, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, and 4, negative 3, 8, 0, 0, 1. Now we need zeros below that first pivot, so we're going to multiply row 1 by negative 4 and add the result to row 3. So that's not going to change row 1, it's not going to change row 2, it is going to change row 3. So multiplying by negative 4, that gives us a 0 there, we're still going to have a negative 3 there. Negative 4 times 3 is negative 12, plus 8 is negative 4, that's still going to be a 0, we get a negative 4 and a 1. Now in the second column, we have a 1 where we want it, so that's good, we need to get rid of that negative 3. So row 1 is okay for now, leaving row 2 alone, and then row 3 is going to change again. So we're multiplying row 2 by positive 3 and adding it to row 3. That gives us a 0 there. 2 times 3 is 6, plus negative 4 is 2. 3 times 3 is, uh, 3 times 1 is 3, add to 0 gives me 3, and then this will still be a negative 4 and a 1. Now finally we have to fix the third column. So first thing we'll do is we'll divide row 3 by 2. That's going to give us 3 halves, negative 2, and 1 half. And then we need to get rid of the 3 and the 2 above that. So we're going to multiply row 3 by negative 3 and add it to row 1. That gives me a 0. Negative 3 times 3 halves is negative 9 halves, plus 0, that's negative 9 halves. Negative 3 times negative 2 is positive 6, plus 1 is 7. And then negative 3 times a half is negative 3 halves, plus 0 is negative 3 halves. And then we need to multiply row 3 by negative 2 and add it to row 2. That'll give me a 0 there. Negative 2 times 3 halves is negative 3, plus 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4, plus 0 is positive 4 and negative 2 times 1 half is negative 1, plus 0 is negative 1. So we've successfully gotten the identity matrix here, and so what we have here in the second half of the matrix, that turns out to be A inverse. So A inverse is the matrix negative 9 halves, 7, negative 3 halves, negative 2, 4, negative 1, 3 halves, negative 2, 1 half. And we can verify that by multiplying this by the original matrix A on both sides to make sure that we get the identity matrix. But if we believe the, theor the proof of the theorem, then this is exactly what we would get if we did all of those row operations to the identity matrix. Because that's exactly what we did. At every step, every time we did a row operation, we were doing the row operations to all of these four, the columns number four, five, and six. We were doing the row operations to that second half of that matrix.
And this process would work for 4x4 four four matrices, 5x5 five five matrices, 6x6 six six matrices. Obviously, the bigger the matrix gets, the more steps it would take, but the general process works. Now, another way that we can look at what we're doing here is that if we remember that the columns of the identity matrix are these standard basis vectors, E1, E2, and so on, then the process of row reducing the double matrix AI to I, A inverse, is the same as simultaneously solving the equations AX equals E1, AX equals E2, and so on. Because for that, we have an augmented matrix, where the augmented matrix looks like capital A here, and then we'll have one additional column where we have some standard basis vector there. But again, the idea is all of the row operations are really happening over here, and the vector EI is just getting carried along for the ride. So we're just doing that n times. We're solving n systems of equations simultaneously. And each of the solutions in each of those additional extra augmented columns gives us a column of A inverse.